Uh, you know, once again, uh, we would not be where we are today without uh, the the involvement uh, and sponsorship uh, dollars that came in from these fine organizations. And so we want to thank them uh, again. And uh, so for those of you who have been in this track all day, sorry, you're going you're gonna to continue to see this. But it's important for us to, to acknowledge uh, the sponsors who, who really did stick with us today um, as, as we transition from a physical to a virtual event. Um, so starting again at the top, the diamond level, Warner Media. Uh, at the gold level, uh, my, my bosses at uh, Kennesaw State University, uh, the Michael J. Coles College of Business, my home department, uh, the KSU Department of Information Systems, uh, Bishop, Fire, Bishop Fox, uh, trying to merge two names there, sorry, Bishop Fox, and uh, Coal Fire, also Genuine Parts Company and NCR. Uh, at the crystal level, Critical Path and Synopsis. Uh, at the silver level, Aaron's uh, Binary Defense, Black Hills Information Security, uh, Corelight, and GuidePoint Security. Coming in at the bronze level this year uh, was NCC Group. And I want to give a shout out to our in-kind sponsors at uh, EC Council for the training that uh, the paid training opportunities that they offered yesterday. And I also want to acknowledge a Secure Code Warrior for coming in and offering to run an online CTF for us today, which is actually ongoing in its own track. Uh, additionally, we would like to thank the following individuals and organizations <coughs> for making contributions to our raffle prize effort. Uh, uh, Mike Costa and Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, uh, uh, Offensive Security, and Pentester Lab. And so with that, I will stop yapping and I will now introduce our next speaker from this piece of paper. Uh, coming up next is Bart Leonard's. Uh, and he's going to talk with us about crypto agility and how to respond quickly to cybersecurity events. So give me a minute here to stop sharing my screen. And Bart, the, uh, the floor is yours. You. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, by the way, awesome job on the B-Sides team uh, for organizing, the way it is organized, the way you well, scale out. It's an uh, incredible job. Well, thank you very much. It has been the, these last two weeks have been the longest year of my life, um, but we are we're we're glad to have been able to pull it off, and uh, we can't thank our sponsors enough, and we can't thank our speakers enough. So, yeah, uh, we appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. I I think it's an example for many many other organizations. Um, all right, so um, I have I'm going to take about twenty five minutes to talk about crypto agility. Um, and it's actually a very interesting, uh, the, the, the way this presentation uh, gets into the sequence is very interesting because we just talked about detecting and uh, the great demo that was shown around detecting and investigating. But what do you do, you do next? Let's say you find something. How do you react? What, how are you going to react and how quickly can you react? And so crypto agility is really about that. Uh, quick responding to cybersecurity events, but a specific type of cybersecurity events. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, so we're going to talk about those crypto uh, events actually that could happen in your environment. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Bart Leonard. I'm product marketing manager at Venify. Um, I've been active in the security industry for the last, I would say, 15 years, mostly on the tech side, SIM side, um, and more recently on the access uh, encryption side. All right, so before we're gonna jump into the deep technical stuff, I want to introduce a friend, or actually a foe, it's not a friend of us, but someone that most of us know in the name of uh, Kerberos. Kerberos, uh, also Kerobos, uh, called in Greek myth mythology, is actually, was actually the um, hounds uh, of Hades. And what was special about him is that this guy uh, was actually watching uh, the uh, undergrounds or the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. And actually, uh, Kerberos, as we know it, uh, sort of the, uh, the authentication is sort of a mechanism to keep everyone inside. And that was actually what this guy was doing. He was keeping the dead inside, keeping them inside 
um, the underworld. But the reason we're going to talk about him now is about something else, and that this this guy was not a normal guy. This guy had three hats, right? And all of those hats could attack him, and potentially at the same moment. And that's what we see often in an incident, in a security incident. It's not just one thing, but often it's a combination of things. It's a combination of a human error or an exposure or vulnerability. Um, so it's a combination of multiple things. And so when we talk now about uh, crypto, crypto has... Um, Crypto can be attacked by Kerberos in many, many ways. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because um, let me now introduce how we get into and, uh, cryptography and encryption is that the world as we know today is a hyper um, connected world, right? It's like um, millions, trillions maybe of devices that are being interconnected. And what have we done recently? Well, we introduced, uh, well, recently, I would say 10, 15 years ago, um, all these connections they enable from financial institutions to um, critical infrastructure to manufacturers around the world to IT services, whatever. And um, because it's all originally was well, sort of mostly unencrypted, we add an encryption to this so that the, con the communication is secure, cannot be looked at, is protected, the information is protected actually. And so the protocol that has been used for this that we know most is, of course, SSL TLS, an encryption protocol that is using public-private uh, key encryption technology. Basically, um, the originator of the data holds um, a, a private key and then sends only a certain part out, the public part, that then has been used for decrypting the entire channel. Right? So... Again, when we talk about encryption, we talk about those keys, public-private keys. But let's go back to our friends, our friends, Kerberos, because what can happen now is that one of those hats is actually sometimes human error. Because what do hap what can happen sometimes is that a certificate, let's say a source of a key, right? It's certificate is nothing else as someone saying that you are who you are, and here is an attestation of it, and here is now a certificate, and in that certificate is a key that you can use for setting up your public-private one, or actually your private one, and then out of that you extract your public one. That key has a lifetime. That certificate has a lifetime. And it varies somewhere between 30 days to maybe a year, depending where you use it, what type of certificate you're using it, and which specific environment you're going to use it. But what can happen is that certificate that can expire. And when it expires, what is going to happen now is that one of those services is no longer being able to encrypt the data. And so now that, services, that service may shut down. And so now what is happening is that we set up all these different services up, these connections, the encryption. The encryption is no longer working and certainly we get a huge outage. That can take very big implications, very big proportions. And so one of them was actually, I think a year and a half ago, which was the O2 outage, which was a uh, service provider telco in the UK. And uh, when the O2 mobile network failure or the O2 network went down, it was because of an expired software certificate. And it impacted not just an individual service anymore, but impacted a total of 30 million people, which was quite a lot, actually. And that's one of the biggest instances that I have seen that I have witnessed over the last couple of years. There was one more recently. Maybe you remember... Um, Microsoft team that went out, I think in February, um, I think it was the beginning of February, Microsoft teams went down. Why? Because a certificate went down and now there was a certain stream of connections that was no longer to be able to build out. All right, so that's one risk. That's one of those hats that can come to you um, and attack the cryptographic world. Another um, the threat is now, especially around the libraries, but even more about uh, what I would call the specific libraries that could be impacted. Each library, each software library 
has vulnerabilities, right? And there may be bugs inside there. And those bugs could be exploited. And once it's exploited and someone finds a way to get in, now what can happen is that someone could create a certificate uh, or could, could not just a certificate, could create a message actually and start exploiting this. And uh, an example that we have seen there, which is somewhat related is um, the Equifax. Uh, issue. What what happened with Equifax is that just as any other software, software uh, specific uh, instance at the Equifax site had a vulnerability. So uh, an attacker was scanning uh, the web. They found the Equifax server. There was a specific server which was around uh, the resolution, which was about a dispute resolution, a specific server, and. Uh, attackers were able to uh, exploit the Apache over there. Um, they were able to go deeper, go to the database, starting to extracting the data. And how did they extract it? Well, they extracted it over an SSL TLS connection, over an encrypted channel, actually. And so although the problem was initially there, right, because that got exploited, they went on for 76 days because the... IT team, the security team at that moment was not able to um, detect it because the extraction was happening over an encrypted channel. And because what the reason behind it actually is was one of those uh, certificates expired and the, the certificates required to inspect the traffic expired or wasn't refreshed and uh, there was no way to inspect the traffic. But you can see it's now the gun is almost turned against you. So yes, there's a vulnerability, but then using the encryption against you as a weapon now to go undetected is sort of the third, the second hat that that animal that I was just showing, uh, Kerberos was, uh, can, can uh, point to you. And then there's a third one, um, which is, of course, about the algorithms. We talked a little bit about that and how each algorithm can have vulnerabilities. But what if those algorithms, those encryption algorithms, are also being exposed and being um, compromised now, as that I would say, at the CA level? So what is a CA? Does anyone know? Usually I use... Uh, uh, I ask questions this time is going to be a little bit harder, but CAs are certificate authorities. Those are the instances that will give you a certificate for a certain amount of time. Well, those entities are also not without any risk and also have been compromised. And we'll give a couple of examples later on. And I think it was recently where Let's Encrypt actually was issuing a statement that there was a certain amount of certificates that were not issued in the right way or had a certain vulnerability or need to be reissued again. And it's okay, like for me, where I'm only managing one or two websites and I can reissue that quite again. But if you have a couple of hundreds, maybe a couple of thousands areas where you need to reissue, it, reissue the certificates again, it can take quite a lot of time and you need something, something bigger for this. Bottom line, um, here is, uh, this is of course what is happening. Uh, bottom line, this was my intro, uh, now uh, 10 minutes in uh, the presentation, but my, present, my, my intro was is that I'm showing examples of how uh, cryptography can be used against you uh, and how Kerberos, the guy, the, the, the hounds uh, actually of um, the afterworld, almost can look at you and start issuing and throwing things at you. One of them is outages through human error or human error related to outages. It can be cryptographic bugs, uh, and we'll talk about it later on, and it can be CA compromise, where the certificate authority that you're using actually um, for the encryption and uh, is somewhat compromised and now you need to react to this. And so what is crypto agility now? Crypto agility has been able to handle those things. All right, so what I've done now is simply explain cryptography is great, cryptography is awesome, we need it, but there are some gotchas with it that you have to prepare for. So here's a couple of things I'm gonna talk about. Um, this presentation is usually an hour, I'm, 
I'm skimming it down to 25 minutes. Uh, we're gonna again talk a little bit more about crypto agility. What are other instances saying about it in a couple of examples? We're gonna talk about specific mitigation uh, risk that you have to take. What is the mitigation? How can you mitigate those risks? And then I'm gonna point out to a couple of resources that you can download and start using. So bottom line, I use the example of Kerberos, but actually what is crypto agility? Crypto agility means is actually the process of, um, it describes actually a way to implement a crypto ready to ensure that the algorithm can be replaced quickly without changing the function of the application, right? That is a description that comes out directly of a Gartner document. So it's basically about, are you able to handle those without changing your application and how it's, uh, and doing it very, very quickly actually. And a prediction that Gartner has said is that next year organizations who have this will suffer 60% fewer uh, related security breaches than those without the plan. And I'm gonna give a link later on where you can download this document and read more about this. But now let's give a couple of very, very specific examples, uh, recent examples of how crypto agility came to surface and, uh, and how important it is and how deep it can go sometimes. So another example of a specific type of attack that needed now crypto agility. So Flame Malware, uh, maybe you've heard about this. Uh, Flame Malware, also known as Flamer or Skywiper. It's actually a modular um, malware. It was, I think, discovered already in 2014 or 15. But it was a, a very large program. Um, it was scripting language, actually. And what it would do is it would inject code into various processes very stealthy. And when it would do this, it would actually try to compromise. It would start breaking different algorithms inside the compute engine. And then um, it increased the computing capabilities and it would start breaking SHA, SHA actually, which is one of those uh, encryption uh, signage um, uh, capabilities that is used. Now, a very specific example, how it was misused. So this is just showing the malware breaking in into, uh, or breaking, shattering SHA-1 actually. Um, but what really was happening is, was the following, and that's a true example that happened, is that everyone knows about Windows and how Microsoft sends out Windows update packages, right? Um, what they do is they create a package, they sign it, they use, sign it by using their own root CA, intermediate CA, signing certificate. And so they sign it through a, a chain of thrust, hierarchy of thrust actually, and then they send it out to individual devices, right? And then you download it and uh, you will install it. Now, guess what was happening is that um, there are multiple of these chains, and one of those chains was the terminal services CA hierarchy, which is especially around the terminal services from uh, Microsoft. And um, attackers were able to go and to, uh, they were still using MD5 actually, and create a fake or a wrong certificate. And then they were signing some software bit a trusted uh, Windows update actually and sending this out. So they were sort of pivoting off that uh, top hierarchy and then using one of the um, key, one of the certificates actually to sign malware actually. And that's how this, another sign of malware uh, got out and was able to uh, reach out to, I think 30,000 devices in total. So bottom line here is that, um, the flame malware actually exploited this, was able to pivot off, take one of those compromises certificate and then sign malware with this and distribute it over out. So again, a weapon being used against you or against us.
Okay. Another example that I have uh, were specific cryptographic bugs that you may have heard about that really got the news, I would say, five years ago, the Heartbleed, Infinium, Debian was one of them, all examples where there are bugs into cryptographic libraries and they allow uh, the attacker to get access to the keys, to get access to them, uh, break them. And... Um, they have happened and more than likely they're going to happen again. Um, now, an, a third uh, example, actually I'm going a little bit quicker now, a third example is all about CAs being compromised, right? Or certain certificates from a CA being compromised. Uh, one that was very recently was NordVPN, NordVPN VPN provider. And that happened recently, end of last year, where again, one of those uh, certificates uh, got compromised. I think it was a private certificate compromised or the wrong one was issued to them. And of course now uh, they use the certificate to encrypting some of the VPN uh, network connection. And that led to, um, of course, less secure connectivity. So um, bottom line here is what is this different cyber incident, cyber encryption events that could happen? It is about abusing the trust, right? It's about making sure it's malicious activity that violates the trust between you as a consumer and this CA that is issuing this. And that is a big one. Once that chain of trust is gone, all bets are off. It's about also hackers trying to um, use those for specific purposes. It's also, it could be about uh, business partners, right? Who are maybe, or who have used the wrong certificates and now connecting to you and maybe the data is going to the wrong area. Um, it could be technology malfunction, the human errors that we talked about, both on the expiration of the certificates as well as uh, the implementation where you do this, and um, in a little lack of internal controls, actually, is that how you're going to do this. Bottom line, I'm showing here a set of examples around how encryption can be used against you and the need for able to react to this. And that's what the last five minutes I'm going to talk about is what can you do now? I'm not going to tell about specific products. I'm going to say about what are now the standards, what are now the best practices you can do to get prepared for this. And it's actually relatively simple. It's actually three things. The first thing you need is establishing a very comprehensive inventory, right? Making sure that you have somewhere a database that um, um, is able to, or you set up somewhere a certificate inventory database, you discover your network and you store or you, you start uh, storing all those certificates um, in that database. The second thing that you have to do is now being able to set that database between um, the individual systems and the different CAs where you're getting it. So sort of a, a step in the middle actually. And um, basically what you can do is when you discover this and you can do it agent or agentless based, now you get a clear view. You can start building a clear view to an individual. It can be the PKI team, but it also could be your InfoSec team, the InfoSec team who's really in charge of all the individuals and, and, and protecting the different businesses and the information inside the business. But that individual inside, whether it's the PKI team or the uh, InfoSec team, is now able to get a global overview about who are, where is actually the certificates, where are they coming from, um, what are the individual devices, assets that I have that, that need this, and what are now the specific certificates that I have in my environment. And so this gives you a better overview also around the timing. And this inventory can now give you a little bit of better view. So it can give you a review about the key lengths. Is the right key length in place? Yes. Is the right key algorithm in place? Are old algorithms, um, uh, are they no longer being used, right? Can I outpace those? Can I, can I replace those? Uh, the signing algorithms, the locations, the owners, the time, the expiration time, um, 
any specific regulations. So if you are in a specific regulations, you have specific guidance around which um, a type of keys needs to be used, maybe the reissuing and the uh, rotation frequency. And then uh, last but not least, make sure that you have an overview about which assets and which certificates on that asset are being linked to which CAs, which are the issuing certificate authorities that are providing this so that when something happens at that CA level, you can act on this. But the first step is make sure you have a comprehensive inventory. And it's not a one-to-one, -one. it's really a one-to-many, can be a one-to-many. What I mean with this is it's an asset, it's a certificate, and then it's all those different at attributes that you have to uh, make sure you have a view on. All right. The second thing that you have to do is establish policies, create clear policies, and that can really depend on the environment that you have. Maybe you need multiple type of policies. Do you have to create them by yourself? No, you don't have to do. There is something called NIST um, 1800 uh, 16b, which describes this very, very well detailed. So if you have time, I really suggest to take a look at this. And it describes like um, how to establish uh, SSL certificate policies, which are the ones. It talks about inventory. It will talk about also the service. What is sort of the service that you have to uh, deploy, that you have to get installed and people so people can work with. And what are the now the specific requirement, the recommendation requirements, key length, all those things. Um, and it's, it's very well described around this. So my suggestion is take a look at this. Also, this section, this uh, regulation from NIST will really talk about crypto agility. Um, and it will describe the capability on how you need to replace that. It will indicate that you really need that capability to replace large number of certificates and private keys to resist from things like quantum computing and other things. And I think the current recommendation is being able to replace all your keys within two days. That's sort of the high level. Now, do you want to tell your manager, well, give me two days to replace those critical service today? No, you don't want to tell us. So if you can do it quicker, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a, um, a, a bonus on this. All right, Merit was one of those, and going a little bit uh, quicker here, um, where they were not able to do that quickly. And the last thing uh, that I want to talk about, because my time is almost up here, is that, so there are th the three things, inventory, policies, right? And apply those policies now against the inventory so you can get the intelligence. And the third thing is now be able to automate um, the management and the replacement. So basically, when you have, let's say, a self-service um, where the individual lines of business could request certificates and, and you hand those out, that you can then not just hand those out, and uh, but you also can orchestrate the deployments of those certificates immediately, whether it is provisioning services, APIs that you're using. SSH is another good example where um, you want SSH, especially today when more and more IT admins are remote, you want SSH, but there's a key part to this again. And so how are you gonna manage that key? How, that key, um, how are you gonna manage that key deployment? How are you gonna make sure that the right private uh, keys are in the right place and that nothing is orphaned, uh, that there are no, uh, none of the private keys are gone and uh, left the building or, or somewhere else. Anyway, so that is now the, the, the third part to protect from uh, cyber incidents, this specific type of cyber incidents is that uh, you can, if necessarily, rotate, remove the certificates, the keys, wherever um, or reissue and uh, rotate them uh, if necessarily as well at high speed. All right, I went a little bit faster. Um, here's something that I want to highlight. If you, so we have, so I'm working for a company called Venify. Um, 
but we offer access to a research document that talks about this. And you can find the link here. It's again about crypto agility. And it's, uh, we promote it. Um, it's not necessarily written about Venify. It's about Gartner that, uh, that describes the need for this and how to do this and what the specific benefits are. My suggestion is take a look at this and download it. And you're going to learn a lot more on uh, the specific capability. There's also a link to our website where you can find more information if necessary. All right, I have about two minutes left for questions. And I'm going to open, I, I can maybe open that now. Yes, absolutely. If you've got questions, post them in the Slack channel for Bart. Uh, let's see if I can open my Slack channel. I don't see any questions coming up. Maybe I'm not looking at the right. Yeah, I see what, okay. I All saw right. Wes Lambert typing. So yeah, just okay. some, some nice compliments and some thank yous yep. and nice job. So. Thank you so much, Wes. Cool. And uh, thank you so much, Andy, as well.